Hi there, welcome to Start Making. We've got a really good video for you this week. It wasn't even one I was going to make. Three weeks ago, I released the five worst woodworking tools that I've ever experienced. And it was just so that people starting their journey out might avoid some of the pitfalls that I made early on. Now, you guys out there, everybody that watched sent so many useful comments on that video, so much feedback, ways to get past the bad tools, use them better, or even just have something in its place that would do a better job. And that's led me to this video. Don't switch off if you haven't seen the first one, you can watch it afterwards. In this one, I'm gonna show you the same five tools, but we're not gonna go over the bad stuff again, we're gonna go over the good stuff. What can we do instead? I learned more reading those comments than I did making the video itself. As with every video, if you enjoy it as you're going along, if you're enjoying it already, please click the like button, drop me a comment, any other tools you wanna see thrown in for the next time, anything else that you think would do a better job than what I've replaced it with, please pop it in there. And of course, please subscribe and we can keep on making these videos. Now remember to stick around to the end of the video because this is where I took some genuine criticism and I'm fine with that. It may have been me doing it wrong, but we're gonna put it to the test. I'm gonna have an experiment with it and see if it is me or the jig. Stick around and see. On to the first one. Okay, one of the tools that I was a little bit critical about was the square. It just wasn't square. Now, I had some amazing comments about this. Really, really helpful stuff. The, the one bit of advice that echoed throughout all of them was, I used the edge of my bench to draw the lines, and how do I know that's straight? It's a fair point. So what I've done here, I just want to repeat the process of testing it using a known straight edge. So I'm just going to rest it up against the back for the reference. I'm doing it on the outside, so I make sure I do it on both sides. Okay. Let's do the inside next to it. Eye for inside, you can see there's a small discrepancy in the thickness of the line as it goes up, not bad. But then the outside, there's actually, you can see the lines are together there, the pen has actually parted there. With a straight surface, it still registers as incorrect. Firstly, thank you to everyone who commented, who told me, get yourself a reference edge on there. That's really helpful. Great information for everyone starting out and testing all their equipment. Secondly, if you buy the very, very, very cheapest, don't expect it to work the same way as the most expensive. Not everybody can afford to buy the most expensive. So if you can't afford the most expensive, what do you do? And here's what I did. Obviously I bought this, I rave on about this. This is the speed square. So to, this is square, this does everything that that other one does, and it's square. But what I've got here are two combination squares. Now this one, a lot of people will know, this is Starrett. It's not massive, but it is very, very, very accurate, very well made. You can do 90, you can do 45 on it, you can do depth on it. It's brilliant. It's very, very good, but it is very expensive. It's top end of the line for these, up there with woodpeckers. So I went to the same place that I bought the orange one from actually, and I took my speed square with me. Sounds a bit daft, but in the shop I could then measure up to see if what they're offering is square. One thing that um, was put in the comments is why not go to a shop and test out what you're going to buy? Why not see what they're offering? And that was what I, what I did. I went and got this. This was about half the price of this. And I think this would be my recommendation is if you're on a budget, maybe go for the most expensive you can afford comfortably and test it before you use it. So go in the shop with something you know is square and check it out. I showed you in the first video that this F clamp doesn't clamp, okay? So I'm just gonna show you it's the same F clamp, holding it together, tightening it up. As you can see, the bar is walking its way down. I showed you the results of one I'd already done but I just want to show you quickly how I do it and what else we do after that. It's not going to be in too much detail, but it's going to be enough to show you exactly what I think you need to do if you've got one of these clamps doing the same thing as this. What we're gonna do first is we're going to redo the grooves all the way down it, okay? I've got my rounded file. The reason I've chosen this is because it's got really nice sharp edges, nice thin wedge. You can use a triangular file but I'm just gonna put it in every third or second existing groove, and I'm just going to do that many strokes. You can use a hacksaw for this, and please don't criticize the file technique. 
Okay, so I've just flipped it over and now I've got the inside. You could stop. It might be that doing the back is enough, but if it's not, or if you want to do a thorough job, grab your hacksaw or grab your file and let's go again. So I've got all of the notches cut. One thing that I would suggest is just go over it very gently so you're not going to cut yourself. You'll notice once you've done it, it's already rougher to move the pieces up. That's what you want. You want that gripping. Now, I've come straight out of that. I have not tested this myself. Two blocks of wood, tighten it. I'm giving that some pressure. I'll show you, right? I'm hitting that down. It's not slipping down the bar, it's bitten. Really happy that worked. Bit relieved as well. If you find it's still slipping, check that you've got enough notches. I'll show you how many I've done there. You see each of the fresh ones that I've put in. Now, my recommendation doesn't stop there. These clamps are notorious for losing the rubber bits and then you end up marring your work. So, next step. Grab yourself some super glue, CA glue, as they like to call it, and pop the top one on. Just pop a couple of dabs on it, and that's gonna stop you from losing your rubber bits. If you haven't got super glue, epoxy will do the same job. There you go. And then just pop the rubber back onto it. Do the same for the bottom one. Push it all the way to the top, tighten it up, Leave that to dry for a few minutes. Now, before I give you the last tip on this one, I just want to apologize to everybody that gave advice. I was actually planning on reading out each piece of advice with the name and early days in the comments, I started writing them down. The problem is there's too many lovely people out there that give me all this advice that I couldn't write all the names down. There's multiple per piece of advice. So it's a group, thank you. I appreciate each and every one of them. I learned more from that video than probably you guys watching it. Have a look at the video and when you're looking, read some of the comments. People were lovely, genuinely. This tip I can attribute to someone. I've been watching um, Rob Cosman. I've been watching him a lot as I've been learning. The guy is a craftsman. If you look at his tools, you'll notice that he has adjusted the handles. These don't give you a good grip, these wooden handles. And this is ice hockey stick, stick tape. It's fantastic. Now what he does is what we used to do on our ice hockey sticks and I'm sure what he's done in the past is he takes it and twists it so that you get a, hold the, hold the one tap, so you get a cord if you like. Then you stick the top to the top of your handle and you just wrap the cord around it. Until you get to the bottom, stick the last bit on. Doesn't matter how neat you are, but what it gives you is a raised cord all the way down. Then you just wrap the tape around the handle. Give it a grab, feel it. It's got a really tactile feel, I love it and there you go, you've re-gripped your F-clamp. So between the grooves, the grip, and the glue, that F-clamp is now good to go. I'm now gonna go and put this on everything that's got a handle. I could have sworn I threw this away. On the video, you'll have seen that I couldn't get this to do anything. Too much play, rubbish, this was a con. This is genuine. The other ones, ah, they might need some tweaking, might be able to work, maybe I went too cheap. This one is just utter rubbish. I had some great comments on recommendations for ones that, that people had that worked. I cannot say that this is my recommendation, but the most common was Milescraft. So if you're looking at getting one of these, that one was the one that came up the most with the most positive comments. Other ones that did really well were the Axminster and the Rockler versions of this. So between the three, depending on where you're based, have a little look, read the reviews, have a look at the comments on the first video, and that will help you get a replacement. Now for me, there was one other really good bit of advice that was given to me. Why don't you practice? I've got a drill, I've got drill bits, and I've got loads of scrap wood. And you know what? The one thing I never thought of doing was actually perfecting how I do it without any guides. Why rely on a jig? I mean, yes, it's easy, but in a pinch, if all you have is a drill and you don't want to spend any money on the expensive drill guides, because some of them do go up and up in price, why not practice? Drill a hundred holes. Get a really dodgy bit of scrap wood, some old ply, stick two together, whatever you want, and then just go out drilling. And each time you drill it, put a dowel in, measure the angle, and see how far you are off getting it 90 degrees. If you do anything enough times, you will improve. So if you've got time, as opposed to a budget to buy a fancy drill press, 
What a great idea. There was another bit of advice. And I love a gadget, but I love a simple gadget. This one was check out a channel by a gentleman called Andrew Klein with a K. He uses a CD and then you check the reflection to see if it's drilling square. So simple it might just work. I love a good simple way of making a job easier and better. So we've got a scrap of three quarter inch ply. We've got a drill and the technique is to drill through a CD, through the hole in the middle and where the drill bit goes will be guided by the reflection on the CD. Tricky to see it front and back, but side to side, it's a really good way of doing it. Front to back, you have to move your head. But Andrew Klein's got an even better jig that actually fixes that issue. For me, I want to keep it simple. But first, what CD do you use? Well, our household collection is here in my pocket. I'm going to choose my favourite. What have we got? Pepper Pig. Gruffalo, Pepper Pig, Pepper Pig, Pepper Pig. I'm going to use Pepper Pig. Where did all my cool music go? Put the drill where you want it. Check the reflection on the CD to check that the reflection matches the drill bit. So where you're looking at it, look at the reflection and so long as it is in line with the drill bit, there you go, side to side. You can actually put your head over it for front and back as well. How well did that go? Pretty good. It's not bad. Give it a shot, that's first time. And obviously, as I say, do that a hundred times, with or without the CD, you will get better. So the next one we move on to was a really popular one amongst the comments. A lot of people have got these, a lot of people have made the mistake I made, and I found out why. A lot of really helpful experienced people pointed out this is actually a framing square. You can imagine I was two months into woodworking and I was really struggling to hold boxes together, especially like this, the mitered corners. And I went searching for this. Check it out on Amazon. It shows pictures of people holding boxes together, butt joints and mitered joints. So I guess in my defense, yes, I'm absolutely wrong. This isn't doing its what, what its purpose should be right now, but it went on the list because I was missold from what I'd seen online. And as a beginner woodworker, that's why we're putting these videos out to help others on that journey not make the same mistakes. On top of that, I stand by what I said about this. Even if it was used for framing, it is out here. A lot of the advice I got on this was that you can, on the older ones, uh, you can take a hammer and a punch to it and you can straighten it out. I wouldn't know where to start with that, so I'm gonna just take this and pop it to one side. With that in mind, here are some of the tips that were given in the comments and here are some of the things that I've done since stopping using this and that have worked really well. In the video this is what I suggested as an alternative. I definitely did not suggest it as a method of holding the joint together while it glues because it's just not strong enough. But what I was using it for was just placing the piece down, popping each of the corners into one of these as a quick grip if you like while I got my ratchet clamp and wrapped it around. So there is a place for it. There are, however, some very, very cheap ways of dealing with this problem. I bought these online. They are a 90 degree angle guaranteed. So what you'd do is you'd clip the angle in and that would actually hold the joint together really quite nicely while it glued. It is far better and more importantly, it's keeping it square. But these obviously cost money. One thing that doesn't cost money in the grand scheme of things, because you bought the wood for a different purpose, is scrap wood. What I like to do from all of my sheets of scrap is if there's a engineered corner on the end, just cut it off, turn it into a rough but square piece of wood that could be clipped into the angles in the same way this one can. Cut the corner off so it doesn't get stuck on the glue. What I would suggest is cut these, cut lots of them, just spend an afternoon with your scrap wood, cutting a load of these out, hang them on the wall within arm's reach, and cut different sizes. They don't all have to be triangles. You can make longer L-shaped ones out of the ply. The ply's not going to move, which is what makes it so brilliant in this scenario. And there you go. You've got some really cheap squares that you can keep the corners of your boxes at right angles with. Okay, last alternative. Let's assume you've glued and you've got all of the clamps, all the different ones we'd use holding at 90 degrees. Now, I would be a bit worried about the pressure not being enough on these. So this is where the next one comes into play. This is a strap clamp, ratchet clamp, whatever you want to call it. This is brilliant, especially with boxes with mitered corners. So if you want to put pressure on, hold it all snug together, you've checked all your angles are 90, this 
is the next step. Now I confess this is in no way a perfect solution. Like anything else in woodworking, it depends what you like to use. Me personally, I use this for mitered boxes. Anything else, and I can use the F-clamps, but for mitres particularly, it's really hard to get the pressure on the F-clamps without the mitres sliding and pushing apart. You have to almost get equal pressure surrounding it. So what you do, you take your box. I like to lay the strap on the table. Take the box so you can get a rough size. Make sure all of the plastic corners are lined up on your mitered corners. And then the last one is attached to the handle. So then you just pull the excess through the handle nice and tight until you've got it nice and snug. Clip down the clamps that will hold it there like that and then just give it a twist. All of the right angle clamps are still in place so we know that it is a perfect square. We know there's no gaps, we're not going to cause ourselves any issues down the line and we've got even pressure squeezing those mitre joints together to make sure that the glue does its job and you end up with a nice finish. So, if you have these and you do framing, happy days, they might do a job for you. I'm no expert in that, but if you make boxes, drawers, trays, anything like that, get yourself any one of these alternatives or all of them. Cut out the plywood scrap, that is brilliant. One thing I will say, for full rounded, unbiased opinions on all of these things, it's a bit of a mess. That's the only thing it's really tricky to store, but for me, I can still get past that. Hang it on your wall, put it somewhere out of the way, and if you do deeper boxes, get two of them. For this experiment for the Wolfcraft, I've got ply. I've measured it. It's actually coming in at 16 mil, okay? So I've got that, and the Wolfcraft offers a 12 mil option. So I've also got a 12 mil piece of ply. Show you that. There we go, 12 mil, that's the half inch ply. And we're gonna try it on both. So what they say, for the 12 mil, line the side up where it clicks onto a 12. The next thing you're going to do is just adjust the collar and move the drill so that the end of the initial drill is lined up with the line for 12. Now I'm gonna drill this hole twice so we get a good reference on it the hole is very rough and the one thing I worry about with ply is that you take off a layer and then the screw just drives down with it but next thing we're going to try is we're going to drive a screw through as if we're going to attach it to another piece of wood. I've done everything right there according to the manual and those heads are very very raised. As far as I know that's not me that's caused those results with this three quarter inch plywood 16 mil so for this you adjust the arrow to the 19, because it's the closest to it. Then we have to readjust our collar on the drill bit for the depth. You basically leave, it, leave the jig at 19, do it so that the top of the drill goes up to the 19, crimp it off, and then we pop it on our wood. Okay. It's not the neatest, but that's not what we're trying for. What I would say on this one, you look at those and you call them flush. So if I push the screws up towards the ceiling that way, then they are flush. But if I pull them down, you can just see the heads poking up. So I'd say if you get the drill close enough to the wood as possible with that extra long crosshead bit, then you can drive these in and they will just about be flush on the three quarter ply. Um, this half inch plywood, I looked at the Craig jig and they don't say that it can do this. So obviously being so thin, it's tricky to get it so that you can countersink a head. If you look at the side compared to the depth of a head, you don't have a lot to work with if you're going to countersink that head. So I think if it was me, the Wolfcraft jig, I would say you can't do 12 mil stuff. So what I would say about the Wolfcraft jig is it comes down to expectations. If you're not worried about the holes, if you can hide the feathering and the unclean edges, Perfect, if you're not working with thin, thinner wood, if you're working with a three quarter inch ply, it will do a job for you on a budget. But I would say price yourself up one of the options from the ones I was recommended in the comments would be Mascar and from Craig. They were the two that came up time and time and time again. They're not the cheapest, but they came up with, I didn't have any negative reviews that were given on them or comments. 
I have to say the one residing bit of advice that I got throughout the entirety of the comments was, if you buy cheap, the chances are it might fail you. One guy summed up brilliantly. He said there's three things, price, quality, performance. You get any two of those three and you're laughing. So that's it. I really hope that this has been helpful to everybody early on in their journey and to some people that might have got those tools and not known what to replace them with or how to fix them. If this has been helpful, click the like, leave me a comment, drop me a question. I'm reading them all, I'm replying to them all. And as I said at the start, please subscribe, join us on this journey and we'll keep making videos and let me know what you wanna see. But for now, I'm Mark, start making.